So welcome everyone to tonight's presentation from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. My name is Marisa Gomez. I am the museum's public programs manager and I'm honored to be joined tonight by our speaker, Tim Highland. Hi, Tim, you out there? I think he's here with us somewhere. Uh, Hello. <laughs> Hello, um, thanks for joining us uh, and for sharing your insights with us tonight, Tim. I'm gonna share a little bit about you to get us started. Um, so we're really excited to be joined by Tim, who is the Natural Resource Program Manager for the Santa Cruz District of California State Parks, and uh, who has spent the last 27 years helping to protect the biodiversity of the Santa Cruz Mountains found in these local state parks. During that time, he has assisted in and currently directs the prescribed fire program for the district, helping to maintain various ecosystems um, by reintroducing fire to the Redwood Forest, Coastal Prairie, and Rare Sand Hills Chaparral. And um, I'm gonna hand things over to you, Tim, in just a moment, but first I'm gonna go through a couple other things. We want to acknowledge that we are going to be discussing the ancestral homelands of the Sayanta people today, and the museum resides on the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Awaswas Nation. Today, these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsin tribal band whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast and the Amamut Center working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward mother earth and all living things through relearning efforts and the Amamut Center land trust and um, often in partnership with state parks. And tonight's program is part of our CZU Lightning Complex and Community Science Project uh, that the museum launched uh, just about a year ago now, as well as the new series, Fall Creek After Fire, exploring the newly reopened Fall Creek unit, unit of Henry Cowell Redwood State Park in partnership with the Mountain Parks Foundation. And um, we have a, a series of walks for, the, for this program. Um, they're all full right now, but uh, we're happy to be adding some more walks soon. So stay tuned. And lastly, just again, please note that we'll be communicating with you tonight via the chat and we'll address your comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but feel free to, to get typing away throughout. And uh, if you can send your messages to everyone, that's more fun. And maybe take a moment to change that setting now and let us know which California state parks that you just love. And on that note, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and welcome in Tim Highland. Hello, Tim. Hello. Hello. So uh, you can now take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Marissa. Um, Glad to be here. Uh, I have was sharing with Marissa that um, uh, fire ecology is a huge subject. Uh, and I'm sending a bunch of folks who work for me down to a, a week-long class on it. And so we have 45 minutes or to an hour to talk about it here. So um, we're just gonna kind of scratch the surface. But I think, um, Part of, just to give you a taste of, of what I'm gonna talk about tonight, uh, I think that to understand fire ecology, you need to understand a little bit about the history of fire in uh, California and the West in general. Um, and so I'll go into a bit of that uh, before we get into the specifics of you know, plant adaptations and that sort of thing. It is gonna be plant heavy because that's what I know and love. Um, and this uh, picture, if in case you don't know, this was actually taken in Fall Creek a little while ago. And it is a picture of um, a bunch of redwood seedlings uh, that had have germinated after the after the CZU. Okay, now I'm going to have to figure out how to make advance the slides, which is a trick sometimes with this arrow key not working right. That's not working. There's something that's next. Let's see if that works. Okay, so if we're gonna talk about, like I said, we're gonna talk about um, uh, plants primarily, you have to understand a little something about vegetation and plants uh, in general. Um, and so the first thing to know is vegetation, it's not simple, right? It's complex and it's complex at all spatial scales. A lot of people said that Wilder Ranch was one of their favorite state parks. This is a piece of Wilder Ranch that includes some sand hills and some um, grasslands and some mixed evergreen forests and redwood forests, right? So 
So vegetation is, is complex and especially in Santa Cruz County, which is uh, the second most diverse. And if you go on a per acre basis, the most diverse county in California. So what drives this diversity? Why do we have such complex mosaics of, of vegetation? Well, there are a lot of different things that drive it. There are um, non-biological factors. There's soil and aspect and slope and climate. And then there's all these biological factors of, of competition and herbivory and pathogens and pollination and dispersal. All of those things come together to create this mosaic of uh, plant communities that we see in um, our local landscape. And then there's another aspect to this, and that is disturbance regimes. And here um, you have, you know, across the state, you have all kinds of different disturbance regimes. There is glaciation at, at you know, points in time. There are tsunamis tidal waves, floods, avalanches, mudslides, um, then human manipulations of mowing and grazing and trampling. So all of those things um, are impacting vegetation, right? Uh, it's going to respond to those. And perhaps the most um, impactful of all of these across the largest area of California, not surprisingly given, um, tonight's topic is fire. So fire is a disturbance regime, just like all of those other things, and it affects vegetation, where it grows, how it grows, um, what, what grows there. And why is this? Why fire? People will say often um, that fire in California is inevitable, and it always irks me a little bit that um, they never explain why that is. Well, there's a reason that fire is inevitable in the West is that we live in what um, is called a Mediterranean climate. And Mediterranean climates occur in various places around the world, first described in the Mediterranean, not surprisingly, but you know, in, in the Southern hemisphere, they're in Chile, South Africa, um, Australia, and these climates um, are extremely diverse from a plant perspective, but they all share this same characteristic. And that's that if you're looking at this chart that we get our precipitation when it's cold and, we, and it's dry when it's warm. So what does that have to do with anything? Um, what it has to do with anything is that things rot fastest when they are either, well, when they are warm and wet. So in our climate, it is very rarely warm and wet. So when plant material is produced, when plants grow, those plants after they die, they don't rot. Like in the tropics, where it's warm and wet all the time, everything rots, right? But things in a Mediterranean climate don't rot readily. And so what you have is this buildup of material um, that is one of the uh, elements that's necessary for fire, right? You need, you need three things for fire. You need fuel, and that's what this buildup of material is. You need oxygen, and you need an ignition source. So we're constantly creating fuel. There's plenty of oxygen. So all that we need um, to start a fire is an ignition source. So fire has been part of the California landscape for as long, long before it was California um, and long before even Euro-Americans got here. Uh, and I'm just gonna go quickly through these different periods uh, and talk about how fire regimes have changed, how the interaction of fire and the landscape has changed um, in those different periods. So um, in the Pleistocene, this is a picture of the Pleistocene megafauna. These are all animals that at one time or another occurred in California. Um, 
And uh, most of these animals occurred before humans showed up. So we had camels, we had horses, we had giant ground sloths, we had glyptodons, we had mammoths, we had mastodons, um, uh, bison, all of these. And all of these animals, you can imagine, had a really significant impact on the vegetation, right? The, the Maasai say that cattle make shrublands, but elephants make grasslands. So um, these animals were browsing, grazing, eating all of this vegetation. And while they were having an impact, there was also lightning. Um, and so there was fire and there wasn't really anything to put it out. So fire was part of the landscape, but you can see in the geologic record that when humans arrived somewhere between 14 and 17,000 years ago, maybe much earlier, um, there is a significant increase in uh, the ash layers that are found. So there's, there's evidence for a significant increase in fire. So when humans first came to California, one of the things that they did early on was they lit fires. And why would they why would they be lighting fires? Well, they were managing these landscapes for everything that they needed. Um, they had to manage them for food crops, for fiber, for clothes. They uh, you know, needed to keep things open so that they could move about. I don't know if any of you have um, spent time in Big Sur back in the Ventana wilderness, um, but that landscape is really inhospitable to humans moving around in it. I was just there backpacking recently. And, and yet you go through these areas that are, that are walls of brush for miles and you get to get to a spring or something and there are bedrock mortars. Well, these people didn't have um, steel tools to cut trails, right? So the only way they could have gotten to these areas was to have burned this landscape frequently enough that it was open enough that you could actually move through it. So just to access places, fire was used, but it was used very deliberately to coppice plants, to, in, to create long straight shoots for the basketry. California Native American basketry is world renowned for its intricacy and, and the skill that was um, exhibited to make these baskets. And in order to make them, you need to tend the plants so that they produce the appropriate uh, shoots uh, to make the basket. So fire was important for, for tending um, the material culture of the first peoples here. Now, when the Spanish arrive uh, during the mission period, uh, their, you know, the, 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 the mission of the missions, one of them, is to uh, run cattle. And in this time, they're not, they're not actually, you know, these herds of cattle are not being produced for beef. They're not um, uh, being raised for food. What they're being raised for is hides and tallow. So at the time we didn't have plastics, we didn't have you know all those things, a lot of things were made out of leather. And so you needed cattle so that you could have their hides and, and create leather. And then also at the time, most light, if you weren't in the sun, was produced by burning tallow candles. So, um, so the, the Spaniards show up, the mission um, are established and huge herds of cattle run across the landscape. And you can see you know, this image of these vast plains. So we've gone from these grazers that were there before um, humans showed up. Then you have the native peoples for thousands of years using fire um, and not excluding grazers. And then you have the Spaniards who, um, because they want the forage for their cattle, uh, 
try and discourage the native people's use of fire. Um, so you have less fire and then more grazing. This is all while, you know, all of these plants that have been there are having to respond to this, right? Um, and then finally, you have the early industrial period and you have the, um, the logging period. And, and at this point, when you are cutting down, uh, you know, redwood trees by hand, um, once that tree falls, there is an amazing amount of slash. There is there's all the limbs, all the branches, everything else there. And so what um, was commonly done is that the timber men would go in, cut the trees down, and then light a fire and have it just burn up all of those limbs and get all of that slash out of the way so that they could then go in with oxen and, and haul these logs out. So fires returned to the land, but specifically um, in you know, the, the quest of, of removing trees. So you have frequent fire now, but you also have the removal of these large trees. So, you know, it's a tool, it's, it's um, uh, relatively common, but you, in some of these large fires, you know, fires set for those purposes, get away, cause a lot of damage, and everyone decides that, you know what, fire is this horrible destructive force, and we need to do something about it. And so the Forest Service, um, the, the U.S. Forest Service decides what we're going to do is we're going to put all the fires out. And um, they're going to do this, they can't do it very effectively until the uh, advent of aviation. And when you can take, you know, someone, these smoke jumpers, and their idea is to put any fire start out in the first 12 hours um, before it gets big. And we actually get pretty darn good at it and have spent uh, 150 years uh, putting out most of the fires that get started. Um, so we're living in a world where most of those fires um, are being put out. Now, 50 years or, yeah, probably getting towards 50 years ago now, um, people started saying, well, hey, wait a second. You know, putting all of these fires out is the landscape is changing and it's not changing in ways that we really like. Um, and so there's a recognition that fire is playing an important role in these ecosystems. And, and you have ranchers and other folks who are using fire um, to manage their landscapes, to keep grasslands open. Um, and, and that's mostly, there's, there's a lot of, most of the prescribed burning that's happening then is, is um, conducted by ranchers, at least in the West. Down in the South, you've got the Piney Woods and folks down there understood the importance of, of fire in the South and ran fire through their pine plantations because there's a long, long needle pine down there that, that likes fire. State parks in the 80s started um, using prescribed fire uh, to manage, manage our lands. But, but there's this, this kind of dawning recognition that if we take all of the fire out of the landscape, that that is not necessarily a good thing. And, and the reason it isn't a good thing is because all of these, the, Calif the ecosystems of California have adapted to fire. Fire has been part of the evolutionary pressure on the species that make up the landscape that we so value in California. And it's not just any fire, it's a particular kind of fire depending on the um, vegetation type. So when I talk about a fire regime, I was thinking, you know, it's like if you have an exercise regime, it's the same sort of thing, right? You, how often do you burn um, or do you exercise? Uh, how how um, intense is the fire? How severe is the impact on the vegetation? And what time of year uh, does the fire happen? All these things, as well as size, 
impact how vegetation responds to fire. So um, fire is not, you know, it's not a, it's not one thing, right? Um, we have kind of backed ourselves into a bit of a corner so that, so that uh, now, instead of this, the variety of fire regimes that we, um, that existed in California, we uh, have, have altered things. So our, our, the fire regimes are changing. Um, and how are they changing? Well, in Southern California, in uh, Chaparral, what's happened, remember we need those three, three parts of the fire triangle. We need fuel, oxygen, and we need an ignition source. And um, Chaparral uh, shrub communities are adapted to infrequent high intensity fire, stand replacing fire, fire that runs through and kills everything. But one of the key things there is that these fires um, are, do not occur frequently. And if they do occur frequently, you can see here that the, the um, lower right hand, at least on my screen, maybe it's the other way it's on yours, uh, section of the screen here that, that burned not just in 1970, but also in 2001, and then again in 2003, you've lost the shrub community. You have burned these and then they've recovered and then they got burned again and then they recovered and then they couldn't recover a, a third time. So back in the back, you know, the one, um, the hills there that only had a single fire, you have nice healthy native chaparral. The ones in the center that seen two fires in, you know, relatively quick succession for chaparral, it can go sometimes 100 to 200 years between fires. Um, you have chaparral that's starting to get invaded by mustards and some other things. And then when you have this really rapid succession, you lose um, all of the shrub components. They just cannot recover that quickly. So why is that um, increase happening? It's happening primarily because of increased ignition sources. More people, more cars, more sparks, more um, you know, accidents, more power lines, et cetera, et cetera. So we have, you know, this has always been a flammable vegetation type, but now it's, um, it is being uh, burned more often than it can sustain. Now we have the opposite problem in uh, the Sierra forests and in um, coastal forests. And the, uh, you can see on the, on the left, you can see this is Calaveras big trees and there's a picture of the big trees and there's you know, open space around them. And, and then you look down just below that and see what it looks like, my guess is about 30 years later, once you've removed fire from the system. And what you have is the growth of lots of white fur um, that is not tolerant of fire the way giant sequoias are, and, but is shade tolerant. So it can come in and fill in those spaces. Um, if you look you know, into the history and prehistory of this area in the um, upper right there, these fire scars, you can see that this portion of the Sierra actually burned you know, every 18 or so years pretty consistently. So that frequent fire is what kept these forests open. Um, and as soon as you remove it, the landscape starts to change, it starts to respond. In the lower right here is a picture of um, Wilder Ranch. And those small trees that are getting started there on the edge um, of this grassland are Douglas fir. And Douglas fir reaches its southern extent of its range down in Big Sur, but it pretty much peters out before you, before you even get to Monterey. Um, and yet it is super prolific 
in the Santa Cruz Mountains, growing in our oak woodlands and in our grasslands and in our shrublands. And the reason for that is that it is fire sensitive. The, oh, I, I, I used to wonder why Douglas fir was so um, aggressive here at the southern end of its range, because I always assumed that it's, the, its range was determined by um, rainfall. But that's not what uh, actually um, limits Douglas fir. What limits Douglas fir is fire. And since fire has continued to occur in Big Sur, Douglas fir can't migrate south. But since we have been successful in putting fire out in Santa Cruz County, Douglas fir is blowing up in all of um, our different vegetation communities. Specifically, we're losing a lot of our hardwoods um, to them. And you have a similar thing in the Sierra uh, foothills on the western slope in all of the oak woodlands there being overtopped by white fir. Um, not, not the same species, but a similar species and a similar story. And so, so that was the story, you know, until 10 years ago, right? We had, we had more fire down in the south, we had less fire up in the north. Um, and uh, things were a bit out of whack. But as you all have experienced um, in the last 10 years or so, our ability to put fires out uh, has, you know, we still have all the same tools, but we've had 150 years of fuels building up and it has become impossible more and more often for fire suppression to, as a policy to work. It's a, it has, you know, we have in, these are the, uh, well, 11 um, largest fires in California. And you can see, unfortunately, I can't see that last column, but the vast majority of them occur, um, in the last 10 years and a whole bunch of them in the last couple of years. So we're getting larger fires um, because of this buildup of fuel and then also because of inc increased aridity due to climate change. So we've got this perfect storm of these massive fires starting to happen. So what we've done to fire regimes is basically we have um, managed to stop all of the fires that were doing good things for us. Uh, and the only fires now that actually occur are those fires we can't put out that are stand replacing high intensity fires. Um, this is for a variety of reasons. I mean, it was any fire that starts has the potential to cause problems, and especially in a fuel-laden landscape like the one that we currently live in because we've been putting all these fires out. So there is a risk whenever a fire starts. And so from a fire agency perspective, uh, the, the safest thing to do is to immediately put it out. Um, but really what that ends up doing is it just kicks the can down the road and we don't get any good fire, all we get is really catastrophic fire, which unfortunately then is a reinforcing story of fire is fire is bad, fire you know causes all these all this damage and, and terrible things to happen, which it can. Um, but we we have significantly less good fire and a whole lot more fire that is um, highly destructive. Uh, so that's where we are. That's the kind of fire. Um, that the CZU uh, complex was, um, although it was only that in, you know, it was that in a lot of it, but I will say that uh, in two parks, it's, it's a very different story. This is a picture from Big Basin and in Big Basin, um, the whole park burned in about 12 hours. Uh, it was super high intensity. It was not anything we ever would have wanted for that park. And then over the next several days, um, Butino State Park burned, and it burned exactly how we would have loved 
it to burn. If I could have lit it on fire, that's exactly how I would have done it. So even in the CZU fire, we, there was a lot of good fire that happened and not just catastrophic fire. Um, and redwoods are, their, their relationship to fire is really interesting. I think most people know that redwoods are resistant to fire. They have very thick bark. Um, they re-sprout. You can see the, see the sprouting here on the boles of these trees. That smoke coming from out of a, a tree that has hollowed completely out, right? So now it's a chimney tree. Um, and that tree is still alive. So it can lose the entire core and the cambium continues to grow. Uh, so, so redwoods are, are supremely adapted to fire, but they also are extremely flammable. Their needles are some of the most flammable fuels uh, that we have in, in our parks. Actually, they're other than grass in the sun, they're the most flammable fuels that we have in our parks. So it's not surprising that, uh, that are a, a plant that is well adapted to fire would actually encourage it. And redwoods do in that they fire climbs redwoods readily with their shreddy bark and so spreads from one to the other and then they put a lot of fuel on the ground um, in the form of their leaves. Like I said, they're adapted. They re they're unlike most conifers, they re-sprout from their trunks and limbs after a fire. Um, uh, they re-sprout from their you know, lignotuber underground storage uh, and um, they can take a lot of um, damage from a fire. So, these trees in Big Basin have seen a remarkable amount of fire. When you look at the cavities in the trees, the holes that fire has carved out and how much this fire, you know, kind of chewed away at those cavities, this was as hot a fire as they've ever seen um, with as much fuel as they've ever seen. And those cavities expanded by, you know, in some cases as much as six inches around their hole um, expands, uh, but there are whole trees that are hollow. And so these trees have potentially seen hundreds of fires. In order to make those hollows, it would require that many fires. So they, redwoods don't need fire up in the North Coast. There are places where um, redwood forests have perhaps never burned. It's just been so cool and so wet that they've never, never burned and they don't really need fire there, um, but they can tolerate a lot of fire and down in the Santa Cruz mountains they have. But when you talk about a redwood forest, sure the focus is on the trees, um, but there are all sorts of other species that are uh, living in the forest that are also adapted to fire. These are um, Calicortus tolmii, the um, pussy's ears, and they uh, were coating the banks of Highway 236 uh, last year in the spring. They, I didn't even know that they were there. And so they're adapted. They've been living in the shade of these redwoods for years and years and years, and maybe flowering a little bit here and there, but they're adapted to fire in that they are, they're a bulb, they're underground. And because of that, despite the really incredibly intense heat um, and energy that was re released during this fire, heat goes up and, and dirt is a great insulator. So these bulbs that are just a few inches under the ground were fine. And now that the canopy has been significantly reduced in these forests, they're getting a whole lot more light, a whole lot more water, and they're um, doing great, right? So they're, they're very, very happy with how things are going at the moment. Um, other trees, madrone trees are, are adapted to infrequent fire. And although it appears as though, you know, they've been killed, it's just the tops that have been killed and they're good to go. And, and respond really, really quickly. Tan oaks are the same way. So all of these trees, all of these plants are adapted to fire. This is not something 
new to them. This is something that they have evolved with and that they have strategies um, to respond to. Uh, perhaps the, you know, the, the most impressive response other than the redwoods in the background there is from Ceanothus. Um, this is Ceanothus thersiflorus, uh, blue blossom, coast blue blossom. And this area right here where you kind of see this whole forest of them showing up is a spot where um, there was no evidence of them at all uh, prior to the fire because the last time they were here was whenever this, you know, 10 years after the last time it burned. So those plants came up, they flowered, they lived, they died, they fell back down, they rotted and they were nowhere in evidence, but their seeds were there in the seed bank just waiting um, for the next fire for the next opportunity to come up and do the same thing. Um, and we, you know, as humans, anything that lasts more than about a hundred years, which is longer than us, um, we think is kind of an amazing long time. Uh, but seeds in the seed bank can, can outdo us by, you know, half again as long. So um, there were all of these seeds just waiting and, and now here they are um, germinating and, and growing. Also, you have, um, grasses that are, are extremely happy to have all the light and water that they haven't uh, had access to with the redwoods slurping it all up. Um, this is a picture of uh, pine grass, um, uh, Calamagrostis rubescens, that uh, thrives in these um, uh, after fires and actually blooms, tends to only bloom after a fire. There's lots of plants that that don't bloom after a, until after a fire. But redwood sorrel, I always thought redwood sorrel would suffer horribly from a fire because most of its rhizomes, most of its underground stems are actually in the duff that got consumed. But there appear to be enough um, of those underground stems that are actually down in the soil that when we, uh, this isn't a picture from Big Basin, but, but uh, there's lots of redwood sorrels still there. So it seems to do just, just hunky-dory with fire. So as delicate a plant as that, and the ferns as well, except where there's really huge accumulations of, um, of litter, uh, they have enough growing points kind of down low that they do well uh, with fire. So that's, you know, redwood forest plants. Um, the chaparral is a whole nother story, right? The redwood forest can tolerate that high intensity infrequent fire. We're watching it recover, but it's not the sort of fire that we ever would have hoped for. Redwoods do better with relatively frequent low intensity fire. The, the, um, the, as best as anyone can tell, the, the fire return interval for uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains in redwood forests, the mean fire return interval was somewhere between seven and 12 years. So you would have a fire anywhere on the landscape every seven to 12 years, not every 150 years. Um, that's not the case with chaparral. With chaparral, it can go, you know, 50 to 150 years, depending. Um, this is a picture of some knob cone pine uh, cones that um, fell down after one of our prescribed burns. And you can see there's a smattering of seeds out there. Um, knob cone pines are, are uh, grouped with the fire pines. They have cones that stay closed until uh, they're heated, and then they open and, uh, and disperse their seeds. So they um, are, uh, the, the, the tree itself dies in the fire, but it goes ahead and, and spreads out its seedlings. And there's another one of our prescribed fires in the, in the San Chaparral at um, Henry Cowell. And you can see how happily the knob cone pines are, are growing back along with some of the manzanitas and a, and a lupin and all kinds of stuff. Um, like I said, chaparral is, is adapted to high intensity, infrequent fires. If there is no fire in chaparral, eventually all of the organic material that these plants produce create a litter layer that is dense enough that trees like, um, like oaks and um, 
Douglas fir are able to colonize those areas and then shade the chaparral out. So our chaparral um, in Northern California needs fire. Now chaparral in Southern California, because they have so much less rain um, and those plants produce so much less material, doesn't actually ever need to burn to persist. But if there isn't a fire in the Santa Cruz Mountains, you know, after about around 150 years, you start seeing these manzanita skeletons under oak trees. And you can see that the shrub communities are shrinking. Um, ironically, I was, when I first started uh, working in parks and doing prescribed burns, I was, you know, concerned because I saw all these, these skeletons of uh, manzanitas and other um, shrubby species. And I thought, well, you know, that's it. They really need our help. They're, they're disappearing. But because fire management writ large puts all of those low intensity fires out, we end up with infrequent high intensity fires. So our current management by our, our you know, Department of Forestry and Fire Protection is favoring shrub communities. We're actually have changed the fire regime to favor these communities. Um, let's see. Oh, looking at some of the things, not only do you get, you know, stump sprouters and, and, uh, and uh, large woody things with seeds, but also you get a flush in the first few years after a fire of um, annual plants. And this is, uh, uh, I suppose, I don't know what its common name is. Anyway, it's Mimulus ratania. I think it's just Rattan's Mimulus or something like that. But it's a it's a rare uh, species of monkey flower that um, is a fire follower here in our sand hills, and it was nowhere to be seen before we burned, and it was everywhere right after, and now it's kind of fading again. Um, another uh, plant named after <laughs> after uh, whoever Rattan was. Um, this is the Santa Cruz Mountain Beard Tongue. It's a penstemon that um, loves uh, to follow fire. It's, it's not an annual, but it only lasts, you know, again, a few years before it kind of finally peters out without fire. Um, but you get some of these beautiful fire following plants. Whoops. And um, uh, it's not just plants. I thought I would throw an animal in here because there's the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat that only occurs in, in the um, Sandhills uh, chaparral in Santa Cruz County. And this is a picture of one that was trapped in one of our uh, burn plots um, that we did in Henry Cowell. Um, and we had trapped there prior to the burns and they weren't there. And then UCSC uh, students went out there and trapped again. And we were really happy to see that we had changed the habitat. You can see behind uh, this happy student um, how different that looks um, from the you know overhead high uh, manzanitas, um, and it was something that the kangaroo rats seemed to like. So, so the last community that I wanted to talk about was is um, our grasslands. Without fire, grasslands pretty much just disappear if they're not grazed and they're not burned. Then you can see here um, madrones and coyote brush and um, live oaks and uh, Douglas fir are invading. These are grasslands in Wilder Ranch. But you can see in the background we're we're burning those grasslands. Without that, they they go away really quickly. And with fire, you know, one could hope for this, and we actually got this. This is up at Año Nuevo um, in the footprint of the CZU fire. Um, you do have these long-lived annuals. Um, uh, lupins have a very hard seed coat and persist for a long time in the seed bank. And so um, when you have a fire, you sometimes get flushes of, flushes of annuals like this. And that's what we got there at, uh, uh, at Año Nuevo in the grasslands there. So this is a favorite quote of mine. Um, that every landscape in California is either burning, recovering from a burn, or waiting to burn. Um, and that, you know, is more or less true, 
given, as I said at the beginning, because we're in, in a um, Mediterranean climate and there's a continual buildup of fuels, this is uh, kind of nature's way of recycling those fuels. There really isn't another way to do it um, in this sort of climate. So I think that that's about the amount of time that we wanted to use for me talking at you. And um, I think I'll stop there. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I've listened to a lot of talks about fire ecology in California now from lots of different perspectives. And I learned a lot of, a lot of new things during, um, during your talk. So thank you so much. And for everyone joining us, if you have questions for Tim, drop them in the chat. I have several myself that I'll get us started with. I'm interested in this idea of like the opportunity that has arisen from the CZU uh, fires on a number of our local state parks and this idea that, you know, you've been dealing with this buildup of fuel in them for so long and how that impacts your management strategy. And then now you've got all this new acreage that has just recently burned. And, you know, what, what is that, what changes are coming from that and how are like in a place like Big Basin that, that burned um, so intensely, are you going to start bringing fire in there more frequently now that it's not as uh, much of a risk of having um, an intense fire get out of control there? Uh, ab absolutely. I mean, this is it. I'm so glad you brought that up because it really is an opportunity. You know, although it was a tragedy, it's... Uh, to have reduced the fuels in that large area is we, Big Basin, and it wasn't that we weren't burning Big Basin before. We, we would burn 300 acre plots as often as we could. We'd gone kind of through a, through a, a rough patch where the weather had not uh, cooperated, but we always were, we had to burn relatively cool. We had to wait for it to rain and we had to wait for, you know, so the fire behavior would not be extreme. And now, we have this hard reset. Um, my plan is to actually, instead of burning, and then also 300 acres of redwood fuels is a lot of smoke. And that smoke potentially, you know, goes into the San Lorenzo Valley and nobody likes smoke. Um, so now we have the hard reset. I'm looking at burning a thousand acres at a time. There will probably be significantly less smoke because there's significantly less fuel and there's gonna be, um, some real opportunities to, to try and get things back on that seven to 12 year cycle mm -hmm. um, because we'll be able to burn in larger areas. And it turns out it's, I'm, I'm not the only one, not surprisingly, all of these kind of mega fires around the state, the, the land managers there, that's where the, their prescribed burn program is, you know, starting like, okay, we will work off of this anchor and we will, um, increase pace and scale on that on that prescribed burn. So in a place that, that has recently burned versus um, parts of, of our local state parks that didn't recently burn, mm -hmm. you're talking about similar strategies, but just like smaller plots for the, um, for places like, I mean, what would, they, like the vast majority of Henry Cowell, are you doing like a similar size um, burn plot in that part that you had been doing in Big Basin prior to CZU? Right. So you, you, I didn't, you kind of glitched right there in the middle of that, yeah, but yeah, yeah we, we, we can, uh, yeah, we can only burn, you know, relatively small places like in Henry Cal. That's a little hard. And again, because now Henry Cal, all of Santa Cruz is down Valley from that. Right. So if we put up a bunch of smoke first, it goes over and it drops into Felton and we smoke everybody out in Felton. And then at night it all, the smoke goes down and goes into Santa Cruz proper. So, so smoke is a big, um, restriction on what we're able to do because, you know, realistically, the, the Clean Air Act doesn't allow for us to do that. Um, so Big Basin is far enough away that we can burn larger acreages and, um, and also something like Butano that burned so beautifully is a long way away from a whole lot of people and we may be able to do some very, you know, much larger burns there. Yeah, I liked what you said about if you could have lit it on fire. <laughs> That's how you would have done it. <laughs> that is what you're trying to do in some ways. Um, so we have gotten some questions in the chat. Let me see. Um, so speaking of Butano, why do you consider the fire at Butano 
um, to have burned in the right way. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, it, uh, it started on the ridge. At, it started in a bunch of places, but in Butte, no, it started up on the ridge. And so it backed through the park. And so in the redwoods, in the forest, it was relatively low intensity backing fire. And then it would run up through the chaparral and do a, you know, and do a stand replacing thing in there. Um, so the fact was that we didn't get that really high intensity fire in the redwood forest. It was low intensity. And the only reason that that happened was because uh, the fire suppression agencies were busy saving everybody's home over in the San Lorenzo Valley. And so we, you know, got lucky and, and the fire was allowed to back through the park. And yeah. like I said, do exactly what we would want it to do. Um, Kari is curious about uh, grasslands and uh, is there a difference between a native grassland and a non-native grassland when it comes to flare mobility? Um, she was asked this question by someone who was wanting to know, not in terms of which uh, grassland is more resilient to fire, but which is more likely to catch on fire um, or is more flammable, I guess. Well, the, um, our grasslands all have exotic annuals in them, even native grasslands. So um, they're, I think that they're all equally um, flammable as far as getting them started. Um, and then, yeah, you know, grasslands is kind of a, a catch-all. But uh, if you want to reduce the flammability, you have to burn it, or if it's grazed or mowed, so by reducing the fuel height, then that is something. But I don't, I don't think that um, annual weedy annual grasslands versus you know grasslands dominated by native perennials, they're roughly similar as far as them getting a fire started. But um, in the grasslands that we've burned it on in Oyabo repeatedly, uh, those places that have the 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 most significant um, burn with significantly lower intensity. So they may get started just as easy, but they don't, the flame lengths are, 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 are much less. Yeah. And in general, grassland fire is never going to be as intense as a, um, right. yeah. Uh, speaking of non-native invasives, are, is that something that you're monitoring for in places like Big Basin? Like what kinds of, um, research are, are going on there and what have you been finding? Well, yeah, I mean, the, um, I mentioned um, ceanothus as, and lupins as great fire followers. Well, French broom is, you know, adapted to, is adapted to infrequent disturbance. That's what it's, it's, you know, strategy is live fast, die young, have a lot of kids, and then just wait for those kids to, for there to be a disturbance, right? So this is a, another opportunity because the seed bank of the, of the French broom that is throughout the park has been um, expressed and now you have all of these uh, broom plants that are um, available. If we can go ahead and kill them before they set seed, then we've made a huge inroads. And then we'll also, because there's a lot more bare ground, we're going to have uh, jubata grass. You know, is is going to be able to get a toehold in a lot of places it didn't used to be able to because redwood forests typically are really resistant to um, invasion. Mm -hmm. So we are also getting in Big Basin, you know, a lot of weeds that I'm not particularly concerned about, but they're early colonizers, wind dispersed weeds, and they'll mm -hmm. blink out once the redwood forest gets reestablished. But those things like jubata grass and, and um, French broom are something we're, we're working on hard okay. right so now. So you're targeting them. Oh, right. yeah. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> um, and then let's see, Lisa's curious about... Uh, fire in live oak woodlands. What is good fire regime in the oaks? I guess as opposed to like the shop around. Yeah, yeah. and oaks are oaks are are pretty. Yeah, oaks are pretty um, uh, fire resistant. You know, those oak woodlands don't tend to burn hot, except in really really extreme extreme events. And so, um, good fire regime in, in an oak woodland, again, is kind of on that 12 year sort of cycle. So that what you do is you kill all the Douglas fir that are, you know, that would uh, invade and, and shade out the oak woodlands. Um, but generally oak woodlands, you know, would burn at a low intensity 
Um, cause oak leaves don't really like to burn. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but they're the wrong shape. They're the chemistry isn't great. They just kind of smolder. So, um, until you get a crown fire rushing through, you know, drought stricken oaks, really it's a very low intensity, slow kind of fire. Yeah, um, this is, this isn't quite the same. Cause I, I'm thinking of tan oak, which isn't like a true oak, but I've been noticing that in the burn zone that there's a lot of full tan oak leaves that have not turned to dust that are yes. just littering and everywhere. Yeah, and tan oak leaves, again, in my years of lighting fires in forests, um, you know, they are not particularly flammable. They, you can, you can run a fire through those and you just get, you know, four to six inch um, flame lengths and it's very friendly fire because tan oaks are not well adapted to relatively frequent fire. So it doesn't behoove them to be flammable. Uh-huh, okay. Um, someone also asked about, and th this, so the, the point that you made about rot at the beginning was mind blowing to me because it's like obviously, but I had not thought about it that way before. Um, so thank you so much for that. And so speaking of rot or mushrooms and fungus, um, someone's curious about uh, the noticeable effect on the numbers of species of mushrooms in the burn area because of fires. Have you have you noticed any differences in the mushrooms coming up? I'm um, I'm trying to think of his name. We've got a really great mycologist here who is studying that and looking at things. And there's concerns about some some species that um, you know this was a su southern extent of their range. And uh, I, I wish his uh, Christian Swartz. Yeah. Yeah. Christian Swartz is is looking at the the what is going on with the the fungus in in Big Basin and. Some things may have blinked out. He's also seen things he's never seen before. So there are, you know, fire following mushrooms apparently. Um, but I am I am no mycologist. So. Yeah, well, and I'll, I'll say, I'm gonna be sending out a follow-up email to everyone, um, including a link to a survey. So you can, you know, let us know what you thought about this, but also a bunch of resources, including um, a talk that Christian gave for us uh, that was about his long-term monitoring plots that he um, did at a number of, of state parks and including um, insights that he got from when he was able to finally go back to his plot in Big Basin um, that, that burned uh, and found a mushroom that he had never seen there before. And he had been uh, regularly monitoring it for a couple of years. And also not only had he never seen it before, he had never, he'd never seen it there. He had never seen it anywhere. He didn't know what it was. And it was like popping up in the thousands. Um, so, so I, I spoiled the best part of the talk, but um, I'll be sending a, a link to that <laughs> recording <laughs> um, so people can learn more about that. And, and we have, and we have similar, continue. similar things with plant species that there's a, there's a um, astragalus that showed up, up in uh, upper Fall Creek that isn't known from anywhere except um, Mendocino and Humboldt counties from two small patches. And there are thousands of them up there now. So. Wild. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so someone's got uh, a, an observation that she's been making. Um, she said, we're noticing a lot of morning glory growing like crazy in some areas of Bonnie Dune that burned pretty hot. There was no morning glory before. They are smothering, recovering brush, madrones, and climbing the redwoods. Where did it come from? How can it be managed? How worried should we be? Don't don't worry. <laughs> it looks it looks incredibly weedy, and it's yeah, and and you know it it wasn't there before. Just like it, just like this, you know, this wasn't in the redwoods before. It was there before. It was there after the last fire. And this is kind of its its heyday, and it's going to go bananas for a little bit because you do, in really intense fires, have the release of nitrogen uh, into the soil, and so it just got this huge boost of nitrogen. All of the seeds got, you know, the seed coats got cracked, so they germinated, and now it's just going bananas, and it will, you know, I anticipate it will do that for a few years, and then it will fade back into the background. And I've seen any num a lot of different species of plants do that. So I know that those morning glories, those are native morning glories. It's got a, if it's got a pointy tip on its leaf, it's a native. If it's round tipped, then it's, then it's a weed. Um, but uh, I've seen the same thing up at Big Basin and I've had people get concerned about it. I'm, I am not at all worried. Yeah, I, I've had that reaction to um, a place like the Bonnie Dune Ecological 
reserve that this was actually um, pre CZU, and I guess kind of now too, because not all of the reserve burned, but going in and seeing how the knob cones were just taking over and worrying so much about these rare plants that you can find there and not wanting it to turn into this like knob cone forest. But I've been told that it's just kind of what they do and they don't live very long. And then, the, you know, so it's, it's just their time. Mm -hmm. and it will no longer be their time at some point. And, you know, I've been thinking about that with what you're talking about with um, like the chaparral not being able to withstand those like two fires uh, two years in a row. Um, and it turning into basically a grassland. And that maybe is not what we're used to with that habitat type, but also, I mean, what's good, what's bad. So, okay, so now we've got more grassland. It's just, it's if it's, of, a weed, if it's a weedy grassland, I'm not super happy about that, yeah. but there, we, we lost a lot of grasslands. You can see on the North coast, um, on the Western portion of Big Basin areas that were fir forest that you can go up and, and there are native grasses in there and there are native forbs. And it clearly was grassland before fire suppression. And yeah. so, and it converted to forest. And now it's, you know, we might want to keep it as a little bit of grass, but yeah, what's, what's, what's good, what's bad. Um, if, you know, if, if we use the native component as the good, um, since that supports all of our native animals, um, mm -hmm. then, yeah, if we can get some native grasslands back, that would be amazing. Yeah, and same with the Doug firs. I mean, I've experienced a lot of people lamenting the complete devastation of Doug firs in certain parts of Big Basin, like understandably, but also mm -hmm. it just, you know, makes me wonder <laughs> well, about I've, I've, how long I've, were they there for? And right, right. And what you see if you look at the if you look at the largest, um, yeah, a weed. I'm seeing in the chat. A weed is just any plant you don't want. So for me, as a land manager of, of um, native ecosystems, um, anything that's exotic, and, and I have a whole hour long talk about that, um, <laughs> uh, anything that uh, did not evolve here, let's just say, and doesn't have those relationships with all of the other plants and animals um, is taking up space and not contributing to the ecosystem. That's the weed. Um, Douglas fir, uh, yeah, if you look at the kind of the distribution of the old Douglas fir, they were on ridge tops and they were in drainages. And those are two places that don't burn. And so um, the, you know, I, I, I said before the CZU that in 50 years, I thought the Douglas fir would be relatively rare in the Santa Cruz mountains because with increased fire, it's not fire resistant. And so where it exists down in those down in those wet cool spots, that's where it's going to be, and up on those ridges where there isn't a lot of fuel, that's where it's going to be, and that's where it was prior to fire suppression. Uh -huh. So interesting. Um, we got an interesting question about again about fungi, um, kind of. Uh, any chance that these mega fires will kill some of the forest diseases, namely sod? Um, yeah, these other. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the impact on sudden oak death, um, Phytophthora, um, yeah, again, not my, not my expertise for sure. I will say in Big Basin, you know, the, the relationship between, we had a lot of tan oaks that probably, uh, probably had a lot more tan oak um, there than we did pre-fire suppression. Um, uh, and, and in Big Basin, um, uh, there aren't a lot of bays and bays tend to be carriers, you know, they spread it. So, so we don't have a lot of that. And, and I haven't seen a ton of it in uh, Fall Creek either, but yeah, the impacts of these, these mega fires on, on, on uh, Phytophthora remora is gonna be, it to just be interesting. I don't, I don't really have any speculation on, on how it's gonna impact it. Um, speaking of Fall Creek, so Fall Creek recently had uh, most of its trails reopen and um, we've been getting to explore it along with Dylan McManus, who's the interpreter for Henry Cowell, and we're going back out there this Sunday. Um, and again, we'll be adding more walks for that one. But I'm curious if you could talk about this, um, you know, desire to reopen these burned areas, uh, the decisions that go into that, um, you know, where are you at with, with all of with, uh, yeah, and that's the, yeah the um, 
the trail systems, yeah, took a beating for sure uh, in the fire. So just making, you know, there's tread work to do, but then there is also all of the, um, all of the dead trees, right? So a lot of the, dis the, the decisions about when to open something have to do with first rebuilding the trails and then making sure as we do that, that we're dealing with um, all, not all, as many of the hazard trees as we possibly can. Now, typically, I'm also the hazard tree inspector for our uh, district. Typically, we don't consider um, trails as a target, right? So, so there are two things in a hazard. It's, is the tree gonna fall and then is it gonna hit something? And um, we draw the line at 1% occupancy and most of our trails don't have somebody there 1% of the time. So we can't make every place safe and that's just kind of what we're able to do. But now you walk into a burned area and every other tree is dead. Um, we have to deal with those trees because there's just too, there's too many of them. Uh, so that has been um, why, you know, why it takes a while. And then the trails really did get pretty beat up um, in the fire, but we are working and our, our roads and trails supervisor, they are working as hard and as fast as they can to open, open trails that connect. Um, the, um, so in Fall Creek, they, I think we're, we're basically there um, for opening up trails and Big Basin right now, we're looking at, of a soft reopening, maybe July one, and the um, we had some help from uh, FEMA, uh, and so the roads will be open, and so those the hazard trees got dealt with on those roads, so those have been made safe, but the trails there, there are over a hundred miles of trails and roads in in Big Basin, and. Um, we're a long way from, you know, I think we'll open up the old growth loop and that's, that's what's gonna be open hopefully in July. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, it's gonna be a long time coming as far as getting the rest of those trails open. Well, it's nice that the, um, the people going in and monitoring now have an easier time <laughs> getting up there with that roof. And just on that note, um, and I'll see if there's any other questions coming in, but um, just curious, you briefly mentioned the kangaroo rat um, do you have any other insights about uh, what people have been noticing about wildlife in the burned areas? Yeah, well, I, I would, you know, for, for Big Basin, I think everybody, the, I don't know how familiar people are with the marbled merlet, but it's a, a seabird that nests in old growth forests and everyone kind of assumed, and we're on the southern end of its range, assumed that this fire, because it destroyed most of its habitat, um, that it would, we wouldn't see them. And we had a um, banner year for them um, uh, last year. So, um, yeah. So, you know, an, another thing that we don't know as much as we think we know about. Um, and so that was really great, just great news to, to have as many breeding pairs of, of merlets. I talked to Chris Wilmers at the, um, the, Lion Project at UCSC, and uh, um, he said, as far as lions go, as soon as the deer are back, the lions will be back. So that's um, and and the deer are, are back. So cool. so um, yeah yeah there was things things uh, bounced back pretty fast. You know I was there the day after it burned, and there was um, you know it was sad to see all these all these uh, burned up squirrels um, and uh, cause they just, they were in the middles of parking lots trying to get as far away from the flame as they could, but that was not enough. Um, and uh, and the place is full of squirrels, it's full of juncos, it's full of birds. It's, it's yeah, it's really, it's really bouncing back. Great, good to hear. Um, yeah, and I hope that everyone joining us has an opportunity to go see for yourself and uh, make your own observations of how the landscapes are uh, responding to fires. I uh, see uh, Dylan's been in the talk with us. I hope that we see some calicordus lilies on our walk on Sunday. That would be great. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Tim. This has been wonderful. It's been wonderful meeting you and thank you for all that you do. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can we can go on a walk with you sometime too. Get you off. That, too. that would be great fun. That's my favorite. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'm getting blurrier and blurrier by the minute. So let's let's call it a night. And Tim, when I uh, when I kick everyone else out, you're gonna get kicked out too. So 
Um, okay. Thanks again. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.